your religious beliefs or lack of belief, you are welcome here. No matter your age, sex, sexual orientation or gender identity, you are welcome here. No importa tu ciudadanía, tu estás bienvenido aquí. No matter your citizenship, politics, or relationship status. No matter your physical characteristics or health, you are welcome here. Whoever you are, wherever you are from, you are welcome in this place. Good morning and welcome to the online worship service for the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Montgomery. My name is Lynn Hopkins. It is my honor to serve this congregation as its minister we're located on the ancestral lands of the Muscogee Creek people in Montgomery, Alabama. I'm so glad that you could join us this morning. I'd like to invite you into this hour of worship this morning with words from the Rabbi Sean Israel Zevit. Gathering the mixed multitudes in my soul. I rummage through my belongings in preparation for leave-taking. What aspects of myself do I need to make the journey? What can I leave behind to memory in the narrow places? Maybe this year we will go out together in broad daylight, not in the still of night, in no haste, soul to soul, holding each other in loving compassion, knowing we, the mixed multitude, will cross together, finding home at last in the depths of divine waters that part willingly on the shores of a wilderness. What if no one need drown this year? And you need not weep for any of your lost children or parts of your precious planet. So let's not leave in haste and move in a mindful pace this year, seeing the blessings and lessons that even the narrow places have offered us. For no place is without you, you who go by many names, freedom liberation, salvation, the place 
wherever we may be on the journey. I invite those who would like to join me in speaking aloud our congregational covenant. We, the members and friends of the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Montgomery, promise to serve our community with open minds, willing hearts, and helping hands as we respect one another, honoring that our perceptions may differ, value our differences, working to better understand them in conflict, give joyfully of ourselves being in harmony with our capabilities, and embrace our connections with each other, nature, the global community, and the great mystery of life. And now we're going to hear from our coordinator of religious education, Roger Burdett, with A Time for All Ages. Have you thought for a while about how important water is to us? So, we've had crazy amounts of rain within the last couple of days of this recording. I'm drinking water, I'm standing in front of the Alabama River, and I'm wondering what would it be like, just go with me for a moment, to ride a raindrop all the way down into the earth, through the water cycle, and back up to the sky. Well, I found a story that, through our imagination, will help us do just that. Welcome to Time for All Ages. There are many things that I appreciate about Unitarian Universalists. One of them is we really like to learn. We like a good story and we like to learn. So let's try to combine those two things together. I found a story called Catch a Ride on Raindrops. My source is storyberries.com, which is an Australian website that collects children's stories. I got in touch with them a few months ago, told them what we do, and they said, sure use our stories. So we'll use this one. The author is Anjali Vaidya, and the illustrator of some amazing pictures is Sayan Mukherjee. What would it be like to reduce ourselves down to the size that we could catch a raindrop and follow it through the water cycle? Well, here we go. Catch a ride on raindrops. Splash in the puddles, jump in the rain. Catch a ride on raindrops falling from the sky. Rain hits the ground and seeps far below. Down where the worms live, past where the termites dig. Snakes slide and ants creep. Down the rain seeps. Trickle between rocks squeeze into cracks. Moisture moves out of sight, deep underground. Spring from the earth, rush with the streams. Race with the fishes far across the land. Warmed by the sun, up the water floats. Into skies far above, Vapor turns to cloud. Thundering in the sky, they bulge and rumble and grow. Till water bursts in pouring rain down to the earth again. And that's where this story ends. And they give some information about the water cycle. But what I will do is say, hey, do some research. There's plenty of information out there. But it really is good to know how water goes from the sky to the earth, back up to the sky, and some of it eventually ends up here and here. And we need it. I hope you learned something. I hope you're inspired to get out and learn some things and enjoy nature. 
and I hope you have a really great week. We set aside a moment in each service to lift up and let go the things that we carry with us during the week. Whether we come this morning with heavy hearts or with delight, we join in this space to be connected together in fellowship and community. And to leave behind all the burdens that we carry and all of the distractions that avert our attention. So I invite you to use the space in the chat adjacent to the video screen to speak whatever is on your heart this morning. This morning as we gather together, we lift up all of those who suffer for our children, our siblings, our parents, our elders, for our friends and chosen family, for our co-workers and classmates, for our acquaintances, and passers-by. We lift up to those whom we may not like, no matter how they feel about us, and those who do not like us, no matter how we may feel about them. May we hold everyone in a spirit of loving kindness and compassion we celebrate the birthdays, the anniversaries, the recoveries, the reconciliations. We grieve the losses, the separations, the brokenness, the absences, and together in faith, and in gratitude, we share with one another.
So a few weeks ago on the spring equinox, I talked a little bit about being in that in-between time, right in the middle. It was a time of nature equal parts, day and night. On the religious calendar, this is that moment. Easter is today for Christians in the West. It's a glorious occasion, and it's no wonder that it comes at this point in the year, the time when new buds are breaking through, new shoots, new leaves, newness all around. Life returns. On Friday, just a few days ago on the calendar, the empire killed Jesus as a religious zealot and a dangerous insurgent, and, and the world was full of misery. His friends and family and all those who believed in his groundbreaking message, it seemed to be over. But then on Sunday, as the story goes, Jesus is back to life, fresh and whole, his body not decomposed and yet still bearing the wounds that he received during the torture and execution. He's the same and yet somehow different, so different that, that some of his closest friends don't even recognize him until he clues them in. It's, it's a confusing story if you try to read it as history, but that's not how it was written, and that's not how it's meant to be understood. It's, it's a story about ultimate victory over death. Death, the only enemy who could never be defeated. This great mythical figure overcame the only thing no person could defeat. It was a promise that no matter what, you can't be annihilated ever. No matter who or what is winning now, in the end, you win. We all win forever. It's an almost irresistible promise. But then the story takes a turn again. Jesus doesn't stick around. He promises people he's going to send his spirit, whatever that means, who can know. His followers and friends are left with a vague promise. And poof, he's gone again. And here is the gathering of folks who would eventually become the church, left in an in-between time until Pentecost. But we're not ready to talk about that yet. Now, that's a story I was raised with and wrestled with and ultimately made peace with as a powerful myth. But these days, there's another story. A, a story I think is a little bit more suited to our current circumstance, at least how I'm feeling these days. Maybe you too. Not Easter, but Pesach, Passover. I'm not a Jew. I don't want anyone to think I'm pretending to be a Jew. But in this tradition, I find a story that that fits the season and situation of the world remarkably well. So I thank the Jews and the Hebrews of antiquity as I try to describe my understanding of their ancient story. It's customary these days to provide content warnings, so I'm going to let you know right up front that God in this story is not one that we would be comfortable with as Unitarians and Universalists. The story comes from a time when deity was understood as being associated specifically with this people, the people that would later be called Israel. Each nation-state had one or more gods of their own, and to this telling, Elohim, literally Lord of hosts, was the very best god there was, because Elohim fights on our side and always comes through. So, the Jews were enslaved in Egypt as forced laborers. They were forcibly relocated and made to work hard labor and construction of edifices to honor the royalty of the kingdom. 
often worked to death. Every effort was made to strip them of their cultural and religious identity. But because of a bizarre miracle in his infancy, one of them just happened to be living in the house of the king as one of his family. And Moses was about to make some noise. He demanded that the Pharaoh release the slaves, promising that the Egyptians were going to face some nasty consequences if he didn't. The ten plagues, or seven, depending on whose version you prefer, culminating in the final plague, the death of each household's firstborn child. And here's where the Passover comes in. By marking their doors with lamb's blood, the Israelites signaled to Elohim to pass over or skip their homes as their God went about killing the firstborn child of every Egyptian family. I warned you, this is not a pretty story. And the slaughter is not over. So when his own son is killed, Pharaoh tells Moses, get the hell out of here. But on second thought, Pharaoh is really ticked off. So instead of letting Moses take all his people and just leave, he sends the armies after them to wipe them out. Now here's where the parting of the Red Sea comes in. Whether you know this story or not, you no doubt have heard of that. God makes a way out of no way, opens a path across a dry riverbed for the Israelites to escape. And as soon as they get clear to the other shore, God brings the water back into place, annihilating Pharaoh's soldiers, dead, the whole lot of them. So now our protagonists are free from slavery in Egypt, but freed into what? It's a really serious in-between time. And there's going to be 49 days pushing forward without any known destination. They expect Moses to know where they are and where they're headed. But frankly, he's almost as clueless as they are. He gets an occasional word from Elohim, but it's not like he can just call up the boss and ask questions. At the end of the 49 days, the Pentecosti is Greek for the 50th, so Christians call it Pentecost. But for the Israelites, on the 50th day comes Shavuot, literally weeks, because it's seven weeks of seven days. Seven is a really important number. It's a week of weeks. That is the day following those 49 that their God, Elohim, gives them a little something to go on. It's traditionally honored as the point at which the Torah is revealed at Mount Sinai. But we're not there yet, okay? Right now, the people have been liberated into the unknown with nothing and nothing to go on. Time is a, it's a powerful and important element in Jewish thought and history. The remembering and retelling of the passage of time is for them a sacred practice. Counting is often used as a way to give structure to or to reveal the structure of periods of time. This time, these 49 days, is a time of counting the Omer. Now, Omer is a unit of measure and it refers to a sacrifice of grain. There's a lot of details there that aren't really important to this story. What's, what's really important to know right now, I think, about history and the stories of this tradition 
it's not necessary to believe or to understand these stories as fact, as things that actually happened. Um, the historicity, the matter of whether or not an ancient tale is fact or entirely mythic, is irrelevant to the power of the story. The stories themselves hold sacred truths and are regarded as scripture, holy writings. As scripture, they can be interrogated and examined over and over again to provide new insights or perspectives. Without regard to historicity, the stories are true, not because they're factual and not in spite of their being factual. The stories are true and the matter of whether or not they are factual never even arises. They are true and we can see their truth present in our lives when we know the stories and pay attention to our own experience. So as the Israelites leave captivity in Egypt in a moment called by the Hebrew term for the narrow passage or the narrow places. Imagery evocative of childbirth. They enter this new life as a people, as infants, unprepared to receive or understand the wisdom and guidance that will be necessary to survive and thrive in their new life. And so in the in-between time, it can be understood as a period of growth and development, like early childhood, growth and development both as individuals and as a people. The scripture lays out a sort of path for this necessary growth, grounded in that sacred number seven. This period resembles Lent in some respects, or uh, the period of Ramadan in Islam. This 50-day this in-between time is a time for self-examination, vigorous spiritual practice, devotion, and moral reflection. In Kabbalah, which is a, a, a discipline of Jewish mysticism, there's a sequence of meditation, attention, and practice over the seven weeks with each week focused on a specific area of human moral character with the idea that through strenuous, intentional work in each of these areas, practitioners can attain a new level of spiritual maturity that enables them to receive and respond to divine guidance. In the days between remembering the escape from Egypt and remembering the revelation of Mount Sinai, Practitioners today give structure and pattern to this period of confusion and not knowing the in-between time by counting, counting the Omer. Each sunset, they start the new day by reciting a blessing and then speaking the count of days and weeks, as in, this is the 18th day, the fourth day of the third week. In the first week, the first seven days of these 49, the focus is love. Love of God, love for God, love among family members, love of other people, and love for what is holy within us. The second week concentrates on discipline, moral self-control, managing our expectations, keeping our commitments, remaining faithful in our relationships, being steadfast in spiritual practice. In the third week, it is compassion or loving kindness, expressed as a value that binds love and discipline together. 
and involves interactions with others that demonstrate valuing the other as we value ourselves. In week four, exploring endurance or perseverance, the word literally translates to victory. It's the trait that enables us to sustain ourselves and each other in community through our challenges and hardships and even conflicts. In week five, humility. And the Hebrew word here actually translates as glory which at first may seem like the opposite of humility. But the point here is that practitioners seek to discard the illusions inherent in a quest for material wealth or status to recognize the glory of the divine in every fellow human being as well as in ourselves. Week six centers on connection, bonds, forming bonds with other people, including intimate relationships, as well as the bonds of family, of spiritual community, and other bonds that we may form that entail a mutuality and a mutual dependence. Finally, the focus of the seventh week translates as sovereignty. Uh, in one respect, of course, that, does, that refers to the ultimacy of the divine entity, Elohim, depicted in these stories. For the Kabbalists, though, sovereignty is viewed here as the result of development in all the preceding areas. So sovereignty here in this context actually is Sovereignty over our own lives and beings in relationship with the divine. It means self-actualization, understanding one's own place in the world, moving through life with faith and assurance. After these 49 days pass, it is a Shavuot. The people are ready for the holy day on which Elohim is said to have given the Torah to the people, but again, we're not there yet. This happens every year. There is no one and done act of salvation here. It is a lifelong practice that happens in community. Now, I'm not going to prescribe the counting of days or the course of intense spiritual effort that it entails. But I see a, a great value in the, in the structure and discipline of spiritual practice, whatever form it takes, can help us to not simply survive, but to grow, to deepen, and to thrive in these in-between times of uncertainty, to prepare to greet whatever comes next. The Jewish tradition is full of examples for working toward spiritual and moral maturity in ways that are tested through the millennia. The specifics of these practices may be foreign, not natural for us in these times, in our particular culture. But I do believe that some sort of regular spiritual practice that is intentional and authentic can fortify us and enrich us for life in the world, life among human beings. Unlike religions that elevate a specific deity who has given specific instructions, we as Unitarian Universalists have to discern and navigate our own ways of spiritual formation. It's a daunting task and can be too overwhelming even to undertake, especially given that there is no divine or moral mandate here, no ultimate command that we do certain things in certain ways. 
But I want to emphasize here that we cheat ourselves if we reject out of hand the idea of spiritual practice and discipline as antiquated or artificial. The benefits to our emotional and spiritual well-being, to our comfort in our own lives, can be immeasurable when we are willing to give it some attention and effort. The uncertainty isn't going away. Neither are we. So perhaps there is insight and guidance to be gained by considering how other older cultures and peoples have made peace with that uncomfortable truth. And perhaps it is time that we as individuals and as a community commit to genuine effort and attention towards spiritual practice so that we too, facing months ahead of uncertain schedules, uncertain developments, uncertain health, uncertain political climate, so that we may be ready for whatever it is that comes next together. Who I am today will not be who I am tomorrow And who I am tomorrow will keep changing every day And all the things I learn might fill my heart with joy or sorrow And everything I learn might make me want to change my ways Oh, there is nothing, no That ever stays the same That is the one thing One thing That life does guarantee There is no one on earth No one knows What path their life will take and no one knows what I will see as I keep becoming me. The family you were raised in does not dictate who you marry. And the country you were born in won't decide where you are buried. And all you once believed might leave you stranded on an island where the only way back home is to abandon it as lies and there is nothing no thing that ever stays the same that is Their life will take And no one knows what I will see As I keep becoming me Becoming me I must stay open to the change Curious and free And always ready
course their life will take And no one knows who I will be As I keep becoming me As I keep becoming me As I keep becoming me Hey you guys, Leah here. So I knew that some folks are celebrating the theme or the idea of becoming this month. And I sat down or probably I was walking and I had this sort of generic idea. I am becoming all that I can be or something like that. And I thought, you know, that's you know, that's all right. And, but nothing else happened with it. Like it just kind of lost momentum. And then a few days ago, this song just came pouring out. It's um, definitely autobiographical without being super specific. <laughs> it talks about um, some of the experiences that we go through that help us define who we are, to find who we are, to divine who we are. None of that's in the song, but you know, the, the experiences, I, I love this Buddhist quote that says, the foot feels the foot when it touches the ground. And that's what this song is about. It's about the fact that who we are becomes really truly clear to us in our relationships, in our relationship to the rest of life. So uh, hopefully, You'll feel and hear some resonance in the song and maybe feel free to write in the comments below what you hear or what you feel are some of the those deciding moments that have helped you to become who you are. Thanks so much for listening. Thanks for liking and subscribing and just for continuing to support uh, this music. It means a lot to me and I'm grateful to be able to share with you. Bye. So I hope you'll come over and join us for second hour discussion. Uh, let's talk about some spiritual practice. Uh, there are a number of things going on during the week. Take a look at our website, the front page, the calendar, the emails that come to you from uumontgomery.org. If you're not subscribed, to those emails, scroll down to the bottom of our website. There's a button there to click to get subscribed. Tomorrow we'll have our second session of the How to Be an Anti-Racist book study. In the You, You, and You program on Wednesday nights at 6.30, we're looking at some words that are used in religious discourse, words that we as Unitarian Universalists may understand very differently from um, traditional Orthodox religious systems, uh, or may not understand in a meaningful way at all. So come out Wednesday night if you'd, uh, if you'd like to join us at 6.30, links on the front of the website. On Tuesday, Interfaith Montgomery meets. Everyone is welcome. Pastor Nettles is speaking about his work in the community. Uh, there's a lot happening. So stay connected. I hope to talk to you soon. And for now, our service has ended. May our service begin. The Crumbs of God's Largesse. God has given, God has taken, still we bless. Even though the whole world is a mess. 
between moments of confusion and duress We're just waiting for the crumbs of God's largesse We complete another cycle round the sun We give thanks when every gifted day is done Asking only for true patience we progress Waiting for the crumbs of God's largesse So make your peace with your ordinary life Look for patterns of perfection every day Know that you're dancing on the edge of a knife That cuts deeper every step along the way It's unyielding and it's unfair The burning questions that linger everywhere the more we know, the more we guess We're just waiting for the crumbs of God's largesse mm -hmm. There are times when you feel you can't resist Thinking about the depth of the abyss But if you focus on the power of the quest You'll be thankful for the gifts of God's largesse So make your peace with your ordinary life Look for patterns of perfection every day Know that you're dancing on the edge of a knife That cuts deeper every step along the way It's unyielding and it's unfair The burning questions that linger everywhere The more we know, the more we guess We're just waiting for the crumbs of God's largesse mm -hmm. God has taken, God has given, still we bless